In the fall of 2018, historian Nathaniel Philbrick, his wife Melissa, and their dog Dora set out on a road trip to retrace George Washington's visits while president to the 13 original states. What came from Mr. Philbrick's venture is his latest book, titled Travels with George, In Search of Washington and His Legacy. The U.S.'s first president said his goal was to bring the country together, and he traveled as far north as Kittery, Maine, and as far south as Savannah, Georgia. Here's what Nathaniel Philbrick learned on his two-year sojourn. Nathaniel Philbrick, one of the more interesting things I saw uh, in researching for our chat was that you and David McCullough went to the same grade school in Pittsburgh. Do you know That's what? right. Uh, yes, Linden Elementary School. And uh, I actually, we're, you know, we're of, of slightly different ages, so we never encountered each other in our younger years. But uh, I grew up in his neighborhood and would ride my bike regularly past his parents' house. And uh, uh, we've talked about our, our great loyalty to Lyndon. <laughs> well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, he did a lot of his work on Martha's Vineyard, which is just 35 miles where you do a lot of your work on Nantucket. And you're both in the same field. What what led you to get into this business of history and whaling and uh, revolution and all that? Well, I did uh, grow up in Pittsburgh, the nautical equivalent, nautical center of the universe. But uh, it was uh, during uh, summer vacations uh, with my grandparents on the Cape that I learned how to sail, and that became a uh, a major uh, 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 drive in my life. And uh, I sailed competitively in college and worked at a uh, a sailing magazine. For, uh, sailing world that's now in Newport for four years. And then uh, my wife uh, was a lawyer, and uh, we decided that the commute we had uh, from our suburb uh, outside Boston was driving both of us crazy. We had two young kids, and I was pretty much at home with them, that uh, w- she saw this job on Nantucket, and uh, she had grown up on the Cape. That's where we had met, and we decided to go for it, even though neither one of us uh, had much experience there. But I did know, having read my Moby Dick that it was the port of the Pequod, and that made me pretty excited about moving to Nantucket. And almost as soon as we got there, I became just fascinated with its whaling history and uh, began to research it uh, between uh, naps as far as my kids and that kind of thing. And then when my youngest got into first grade and I had till 2.30 in the afternoon, I began writing my first work of history way offshore. And uh, that uh, really, I discovered this was what I was meant to do. Uh, it, it began with the history of my home, uh, adopted home, Nantucket, and it's led me uh, into the history of this country. And I'm just so grateful we made the move to Nantucket. What's the difference uh, between living on Nantucket for 30 years and living on the mainland? You're on an island. You're 30 miles out to sea. Uh, You're all figuratively in the same boat. There is just this sense of community, particularly in the off-season, that I've never experienced anywhere else. And, you know, weather is is a participatory sport. (laughs) <laughs> the, you know, it, you know, the storms really are are, are something that uh, everyone's aware of, and and bonds people really, and uh, and it's also for me the history of it. It's it's like a vortex into the past. When I was researching away offshore, my first work of history, I would take the kids to the places I was writing about on Nantucket, and even though it's only fourteen miles long, uh, it's it's just. Uh, uh, it's intensely set, been intensely settled both by native peoples and the English settlers who arrived at the end of the 17th century, and uh, so it was really, you know, it's just different there. It's 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 you're on you're on your own uh, to a certain extent. Things changed a little bit when the fast ferry started uh, in the late 90s, which uh, reduced the ferry time of the ferry from two and a half hours to just an hour. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, so we are a little more connected than we once were, but you're still out there. You're out away offshore. When were you first introduced to John Steinbeck's travels with Charlie? It was, I read it in high school, uh, 
and loved it. And then uh, when I was on Nantucket, uh, before I had made the transition from writing about sailboats to writing history, there was, uh, I learned that there was going to be a Steinbeck in the Environment uh, Conference on Nantucket. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm not an academic, but it would, uh, I'd love to write about Travels with Charlie and his final novel, uh, The Winter of Our Discontent, which is uh, sort of a thinly masked uh, version of Sag Harbor, where Steinbeck lived, uh, you know, another whaling port, but on Long Island. And, uh, it, and so uh, that was when I, my engagement with Travels with Charlie became extremely intense, uh, and it became almost personal when Elaine Steinbeck, uh, Steinbeck's widow, uh, she was 78 years old at that time, uh, and their first summer as a couple had been spent on Nantucket uh, when he was writing East of Eden. And uh, and my wife and I, being the, the, the unknowns at the conference, were uh, given the, the honor of sitting on either side of her for dinner and uh, talking to her about uh, – uh, her husband heading out on the road. She said his health wasn't good. I was very worried about him. But when he said he was going to take Charlie, I knew everything was going to be all right. When you decided to do Travels with George, uh, you suggest that uh, everything that we thought about Travels with Charlie wasn't quite accurate. Yes. Uh, since I talked to, uh, since we met Elaine back in the early 90s, uh, there have been. Uh, actually some books written, some articles written by people who uh, decided to f follow Stein and Steinbeck's route and began to realize there's just no way what he's describing happened. And, uh, and, and this particularly apparently becomes true when you study the first draft of Travels with Charlie, that I think it's uh, it's 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 some uh, uh, library in New York, and uh, Elaine is a character <laughs> through much much of it. He traveled often with her. Uh, he wasn't all by himself with his dog, as he posits in the book. But you know that didn't bother me at all. Um, you know, it's he's a novelist who's who's writing about the essence of what he experienced. It's still a great book, uh, particularly when it comes to talking about what makes us Americans. And so, actually, when I learned that he didn't travel alone, that he traveled with his wife, I said, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. My wife, Melissa, had just retired, and uh, we had a new puppy named Dora. We were going to do our best John Steinbeck uh, imitation and follow George Washington uh, together as a couple with our dog. You taught me something I didn't know about my own town here. Uh, when I read about... Jones Point, where I've been, but uh, I clearly wasn't paying close enough attention, about the uh, Discovery Stone boundaries. Talk about that, and how did you discover it? Yeah, well, it's it's amazing, really. Uh, you know, you go to D.C. and Alexandria, and you, 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 you see all these great monuments to figures from the past, but the oldest federal monuments are the boundary stones uh, that were originally planted in the ground at uh, one mile intervals uh, uh, in uh, to to uh, determine the perimeter of what would become washington d c and they're they're just you know little little granite nubs uh, that uh, you can you the first one was planted there at, at Jones Point uh, right at the you know the southern edge of of Alexandria uh, right on the edge of the Potomac and from there they did a, a ten mile a square with a 10 mile sides, uh, almost a diamond shape. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you can, you can find these today. Uh, the, often there is a, a kind of a green metal cage over them. There's sometimes there, you'll find them in the middle of a sidewalk. Sometimes they're at the edge of a highway, but they're still, the, most of them are still there. There were 40 originals, something like in their thirties are still out there. And, uh, I just think it's just a wonderfully, humble evocation of our national beginnings well you you got me to go to youtube uh, to youtube and just put in <clears throat> the, the uh stones and discovery stones dc and you you can't believe how much is on there and it's also there's a whole website devoted to this uh so i assume as you went to, on your travels uh you found things like this all over what are the four or five things that you remember from your trip that you didn't know about yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, 
I w- we spent a lot of time on the web, even when we were driving, and and the discoveries we made along the way, uh, just we we just couldn't believe it. For example, we were uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, uh, and when Washington visited Portsmouth, New Hampshire, he got a harbor tour uh, there at the river. And he stopped at what's now is Kittery Point, uh, Kittery Point, Maine. Uh, Maine was then part of Massachusetts, uh, but now, of course, it's part of it's Maine. And he um, got on this old stone dock, and and you know, there's accounts of him stepping out on that. And we 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 everywhere we went, we were looking for dog friendly accommodations. And we thought, well, hey, we have we've been in Portsmouth before, but we've never been to Kittery Point. Uh, let's see if there's a place we can stay there. So Melissa did, you know, v- verbo, and and up came this listing for the Red Cottage. Uh, and in the description of the property, uh, it was stated that when George Washington visited Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in 1789. Uh, he he stepped out of the boat onto the stone dock that uh, the red cottage overlooks. And we went, oh my goodness, and, and asked if we could stay there. Unfortunately, it was booked for the night, but the owner uh, wanted to talk to us, and um, and so we went over, got a tour of it, stepped, got a chance to you know step onto this dock, and you know you can't make this stuff up. Um, you know, there was, we were, uh, in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And, uh, uh, I had, before we left, I had, uh, before we headed out, I had made a list of all the towns Washington stayed in, uh, went through and there in his new England tour alone, there were 60 of them. And I reached out to the historical societies and libraries of, of, of each town. And they began to, I wanted to know what, was had been recorded of Washington's visit, and I began to get all sorts of information back. and And from Oyster Bay, uh, I, I received this uh, newspaper account of a woman who, uh, when she was six, eight years old, named Sarah, uh, she was standing at her gate in Oyster Bay when uh, who should uh, ride past but George Washington on his horse, and across the street from her. Uh, they were building the one a one room schoolhouse that would be there for more than a century, the Bungtown School, and uh, Washington uh, saw that they were building this, got off his horse, and volunteered to help them uh, get one of the rafters up into the roof. <laughs> Washington was six foot six foot four inches tall and a tall man, and so he helped them. And when we were there, uh, the historian takes us to the plaque for the Bungtown School. And it was like, wow, you know, here we are. This is where Yosero was over there. This is where the schoolhouse was. You know, uh, it was it was just great. Uh, in the South Carolina, there is Hampton Plantation, a, a magnificent uh, southern plantation. Uh, uh, on your way, uh, as as we were coming down from the north on the way to Charleston, and when Washington visited there, uh, they had just completed a new porch, and the owner of the porch didn't allow anyone to go up the steps until Washington had had a chance to go up them, and Washington did that, and and the woman who owned the the plantation said that the, the live oak just in front of the porch, this ma- magnificent uh, tree with dripping Spanish moss would have to be cut down because it was just right there in front of the new porch. And uh, Washington, the supposed uh, cutter down of his father's cherry tree, said, no, don't cut down that magnificent tree. There, um, the hand of man cannot replace that. Leave it. If you go to, uh, and today, uh, if you go to Hampton Plantation, there is that now a monster live oak right in front of the porch a, a living monument uh, to to Washington's uh, visit uh, uh, to the South. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, when did you decide to take this trip? When did you start it? And why did your wife, Melissa, want to go with you on this? Well, um, we we set out uh, in the fall of, of 2018. And... Uh, and, and you know, it was I had just finished my third book about the revolution in the hurricane's eye, about the year of Yorktown, and uh, I had you know had 
had decided that, you know, I would really like to follow George Washington. I had had enough of bloodshed. I needed to change it up. I wanted to write a different kind of book, but I was still fascinated with Washington. I wanted to know what happened to him next. So I came up with this idea and I tried to sell it to my wife, Melissa. And uh, Melissa has a very healthy skepticism when it comes to some of my uh, more fervent enthusiasms. And uh, she had just retired, but she hadn't quite retired. She was in that transitional phase when she was, uh, she had been a lawyer for uh, 25 years, but had for the last 10 years had been the head of a nonprofit on Nantucket and was uh, passing the reins on to uh, another person. And so she was sort of in the midst of that. But I said, come on, why don't you come with me? Uh, we can, you know, uh, bring Dora, our dog, and, and uh, divide it up in, in ways so that we're not out there for too long, but it would be fun. And she said, well, A, uh, why would we bring a dog follow, following George Washington? And uh, I became a little defensive uh, about that, but said, hey, he almost single-handedly uh, uh, invented the, the the American foxhound, and 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 he had names for his 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 foxhounds like Tipsy and and uh, True Love and things like that. Anyways, and this began a a, a dialogue uh, between Melissa and me, in which uh, I would you know get very enthused about something, and she would sort of tap me on the shoulder and say, "Really?" And uh, and as a consequence, our you know, our, our, those kinds of dialogues are a part of the story as we follow Washington up and down uh, the, the coastal America. What kind of a car did you drive? We drove a Honda Pilot um, and uh, a you know, pretty, pretty big, roomy car. Uh, I think it's a 2015 Honda Pilot, dark gray, uh, plenty of room for Dora in the back seat. Uh, what we quickly realized uh, staying at these places that uh, we had one during the New England tour, we had one unfortunate incident where Dora had had uh, chosen to swim in a, a kind of mud hole and was covered with dried muck uh, by the time it came to us getting to the hotel. And we uh, uh, once we got to the room, before I could get her into the tub, she jumped on the white coverlet of the of the bed. And uh, anyways, it was not a good scene. And we soon learned that one of the things we needed to bring with us was a sheet uh, to put over whatever bed uh, was in our room. Uh, we, you know, we had, we brought along uh, everything Dora needed to eat, and often we didn't quite know where we were headed. Uh, and and Melissa was our both the navigator and sort of logistical uh, person, and would you know find us those places as we made our way across America. How did you break up the trip? And did it did you, did, did you go take the trip all at one time? We 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 uh, decided from the first we had to break it up. Uh, you know, Washington didn't do it all at once. It was really four different journeys, a New England tour, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a sail to Rhode Island that all came and uh, ratified the Constitution after his New England tour, uh, the Long Island tour and the Southern tour. And we decided to break it up along those lines, but also um, cut the, the New England tour and the Southern tour in half. Uh, we we have uh, our our fathers both in their 90s are living independently on Cape Cod and we really like to keep in touch with them. So we didn't feel we could be away for more than two weeks at a time. We also had uh, our our uh, children who both lived in uh, and grandchildren who who uh, lived in Brooklyn and wanted to stay in touch with them. And so we broke it up. I also had a book coming out sort of in the middle of it. And so uh, this gave us the flexibility to, to sort of, you know, hit things uh, one at a time. And it was really, gr when I look back, it was absolutely the right thing to do because it was kind of grueling. I was, we were meeting people at almost every town. Uh, so interview after interview, uh, I was taking notes the whole time, and then at night I would, uh, you know, write out my notes on my computer, and then uh, we'd leave the next morning and come back at dusk. And, you know, and and if I had been doing that the whole time, I think I would have <laughs> died of exhaustion. So it was it was good to break it up. How many nights did you stay in a hotel? Let's see. I would say if we uh, added it all up, it would come to about. Um, 
little less than two months of of staying in hotels. And uh, so we were on the road a lot. <laughs> and uh, and particularly when it came to the southern uh, trip, it took uh, Washington three months to, to do the southern trip, almost 2,000 miles. Uh, we did it in less time. But uh, uh, the, you know, there were a lot of stops along the way. We, uh, what was great about the Southern Tour, particularly between Charleston and Savannah, is many of the roads he was on are still there, and they are no longer highways. That they, They're sort of off the beaten path so that they were very much the way they had been. And so you know, we, didn't, we didn't slow to a, 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 a horse-drawn carriage pace, but it was pretty close. I'm going to read a bunch of names and get you to talk about who they are. I'll be very quick. William Jackson, John Fagan, James Hurley, William Osborne, John Mauld, and I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but uh, Fides Imhoff, and Giles mm-hmm. and Paris, and uh, also Tobias Lear. Who are they? Okay. This is, uh, these are the names of uh, Washington's entourage. Uh, the, the people, who, the aides, and uh, uh, two enslaved workers, Giles, Giles and Paris, uh, who managed the baggage uh, baggage wagon and often worked as postillions, actually getting on the horses that were ahead of the carriage to help guide them over the rougher terrain. Uh, and then there was the there was a, a variety of, of you know other assistants along the way handling the baggage and all that. Uh, uh, Tobias Lear uh, was was really Washington's closest uh, confidant during the early years of his presidency. He was a, a kid from Portsmouth uh, who, out of college, uh, uh, got a job as as one of Washington's secretaries in the years prior to his uh, becoming president, and actually lived in Mount Vernon. Got to know the family very well, and um, he he would run the Washington household pretty much. He would accompany Washington during the New England tour, but by the Southern tour, uh, he he stayed. Uh, and by that time, the temporary capital had moved from New York to to Philadelphia. And by that time, he was married and had a child, and so he stayed uh, at the presidential uh, residence with Martha and family. And uh, it would be William Jackson, uh, uh, born in Scotland, uh, fought in the Revolution, and uh, was was had been the secretary of the Con- Constitutional Convention, uh, and was now an aide for Washington, and was a southern had grown up in Charleston, so was a southerner, and so he was the perfect uh, person to accompany Washington during that southern tour, and uh, um, and this made up his his rather humble entourage. Uh, and you know there was you know the closest to a security detail was William Jackson, someone who had been a soldier during the Revolution, but that was about it. So if you if you happen to run in and into him when he was on the road, uh, what would it all look like? Yeah, it would it would be first you would see his carriage. Let's let's go with his southern tour. He he had a he had a, a two seater carriage which he called his chariot because it was smaller than his larger carriage that he that was left in philadelphia it was drawn by four horses and uh you'd see that see that leading the way uh uh but with with some of his aides on horses riding beside the carriage or behind or ahead of it uh there would be a baggage wagon behind and then uh trailing behind the baggage wagon would be washington's white horse prescott you know his white steed, uh, steed uh, that Washington would sometimes, uh, when he would come to a town, he would stop the carriage, step out dressed in his general's uniform, mount Prescott, that great big white horse, and ride down Main Street to thunderous acclaim. Uh, you know Washington really knew after eight years as, as uh, general of the of the Continental Army, he knew how to make an impression. And so, um, uh, you know, so you could, you know, sometimes you'd see Washington in his, you know, entertainment mode, uh, but more often than not, he was in his carriage, uh, being often with uh, the local militia 
uh, on horseback ahead of him, giving him an escort, which he didn't like because it kicked up dust that would, uh, you know, choke him in the carriage. So he would do everything he could to try to convince the local militias to to not accompany him uh, because it just made it for an unpleasant experience for him. Did anybody keep a diary that you were able to look at? Yes. Washington kept a diary, and um, it is, it's, it's a great resource. It's, it's been published. Uh, you know, it's part of his papers. Uh, wonderful footnotes in terms of, you know, expanding upon the references he, he makes. And, uh, in fact, when we, we drove around following Washington, uh, Melissa had the, the diary spread out on her lap. And so often we'd, you know, pull into a town and, and she would recite what Washington said about the place. Uh, and so those are there. Uh, also uh, published are the addresses uh, that uh, each the, uh, that were given, presented to Washington in each town and city he visited. Often they were uh, from the, the Society of the Cincinnati, a group of uh, American Revolutionary war veterans and or the ministers of a town things like that uh, and so those are there as well as washington's written responses uh and then uh there are, there were all those uh, local references that i talked about earlier that that really expanded upon you know what how people's perceptions of washington as he, as he uh, rode into town how many of the four different trips that he took to the 13 states were done in the first term Yes, in the the for all of them were done in the first term. And in fact, all of them were done um, within his first two years in office. And so he really wanted this to be something that happened early, um, because he understood that when he became, uh, you know, when he was inaugurated president, there was already a divided country. The Constitution had divided the country into those who supported the Constitution and the strong government that it was created. That that it created the Federalists and those who distrusted that government and wanted the power to remain with the states as it had been under the the Articles of Confederation. They were known as anti-Federalists. They, you know, they, these were not formal parties yet, but there was still a divide in the country. And, and, and you combine that with the fact that each state regarded itself as its own country. You know, when the governor of Virginia said, my country, he meant Virginia, not the United States of America. And so Washington uh, decided he needed to, to go out there and visit all of these states, as many of the towns as possible, and show them that uh, there, was, there was a new order in America. Uh, it wasn't just their town, their state. There was something called the United States of America, and uh, he was now their leader. And so he wanted to do this early in an attempt, you know, he, he knew he had a couple of years grace, you know, a honeymoon period before the policies he was going to inevitably have to put forward became controversial. And so he wanted to get this done early. And, uh, and he succeeded, I think, uh, in creating a sense of nationhood among a group of 13 former colonies where that really hadn't been the case before. Just in case somebody's listening and can't remember the 13, I'm going to go through them quickly. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, and Maryland. When he went on these trips, and you say he divided it up in four different trips, what was the longest that he was away? Yeah, it was the southern trip, uh, which was his last. And so, uh, and this was... You know, later, this was, um, you know, by the time uh, Hamilton, who was his secretary of treasury, had had, uh, begun his, his, uh, the economic policies were coming into clearer focus. And so, and those were controversial. And so he headed out in the Southern tour, uh, knowing it was going to be, you know, not only was it going to be the, the, the greatest distance he was going to travel, but the roads were the worst as, and the, and the accommodations were also, uh, fewer and far, farther between. And it would, t- he was gone for three months and, um, he, he, uh, had brought prior to going, he, he met with his cabinet, uh, you know, it was Hamilton and Jefferson and, and, uh, others and, and said that if something should happen and you need me, 
uh, he, and he gave them his, his tentative itinerary, get a message to me and I can be back right away as in a month. <laughs> so, uh, you know, luckily nothing, uh, came up that required his presence. And, and it's a good thing because, Inevitably, the messages that were sent uh, from the temporary capital of Philadelphia missed him in certain crucial points and, and didn't catch up to him until he, he stopped at Mount Vernon uh, before heading back to Philadelphia. And so, uh, you know, that's a long time uh, to be away from the capital. I understand he had a dog with him? Well, he, there is a tradition that he had a dog with him on a southern tour, uh, a, a greyhound, named Cornwallis for uh, the British general that had been his great opponent uh, during the revolution and, and he, who had to surrender at Yorktown. Uh, and, you know, I, wa- I, I fell for this tradition hook, line, and sinker uh, because I had my own version of Cornwallis with us. We had Dora. Uh, but, what, you know, one of the more fascinating aspects of this tour uh, was was learning as we went to town to town that some of these traditions that have become an accepted part of of uh, the history of of Washington's travels are not necessarily true and I I hate to say it but Cornwallis is one of them uh, we were in Augusta uh, Georgia we had followed Washington from Savannah all the way into Augusta you know into the interior and uh, Bill Kirby who is a uh, columnist for the the Augusta Chronicle was showing us around and and he uh and it was all, everything we know about Washington and Cornwallis comes from a a uh, article written in the Savannah Chronicle describing uh, the discovery of a brick crypt uh during a road uh road excavation project and um and un- and they uncovered uh, this stone in which described washington's tearful sadness uh upon burying uh cornwallis who had followed him throughout his tour and uh bill uh said did you look at the date of of that article in the savannah chronicle and i and i knew it had been in the late 18 in the 1890s but i i hadn't looked at the the month of it he said it was april 1st it was an april fool's joke we've since learned that uh we've we cannot find that tomb uh, where it was supposedly occurred uh, was so far away from where Washington was when he was in Augusta. You know, there couldn't be. Yeah, it was all you know, a, f- a fiction. And so that was one tradition uh, we had to lay to rest. There's uh, in Chapter 5 a story about you on your back in Penn Station dreaming of George Washington. That's right. <laughs> well, um, I, you know, George Washington, one of the reasons George Washington uh, was so eager to go on these tours was that almost as soon as he became president, he was hit by these series of illnesses. Um, he almost died several times in the first two years of his presidency. And he realized it was because he wasn't getting enough exercise that the, and the stresses of, 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 of the office were were you know, really hard. He was not only the first president, he was creating the office of the presidency. And so he realized he really needed to get out of the office. And so in many ways, these tours were a way to reduce that stress. Well, uh, following Washington uh, had its own stresses, uh, I discovered. And, and, um, and I was uh, in Penn Station on my way, actually, to a speaking engagement in Philadelphia, uh, and uh, I, uh, that night before, uh, both Melissa and I had come down with what may have been food poisoning, uh, may have been uh, some kind of intestinal bug, and uh, woke up the next morning feeling completely drained uh, and had to ke- catch a train to Philadelphia. And so we were down and we were in New York and uh, in Penn Station. When uh, our train was called, I stood up uh, with my uh, bag, uh, my uh, knapsack full of books, and suddenly blacked out and fell to the floor of Penn Station. Uh, Melissa, I woke up with Melissa beside me saying, Nat, are you okay? I said, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. I got up uh, as a policeman was coming towards me and an Amtrak employee and said, I'm fine, I'm fine, and then collapsed again. And while I was uh, you know, on the floor of Penn Station, cheek against that dirty tile, I began to dream. I had this dream 
And um, that 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 weekend, I had uh, watched Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with my four year old granddaughter, and in my dream. Uh, I was in the carriage with George Washington leaving uh, New York on his New England tour. And uh, the carriage magically takes off. It's the two of us in the carriage looking down at uh, Manhattan below us with the sails of, uh, on the Hudson and East River below us. And, uh, and then we land in Rye, New York, uh, which was Washington's first stop on the, on the New England tour uh, where he stayed at an inn that is still a tavern that is still there now part of the rye historical society and there in my dream was uh, were melissa and dora waiting for me in the honda pilot and melissa i i awoke and i was you know eventually ended up in a in an ambulance uh being taken to uh, bellevue hospital where uh it was determined i was simply dehydrated and um it was you know, and I was just, it was an out of body experience. And it was while researching the New England tour, I learned that none other than, than the artist N.C. Wyeth had had a similar experience. He had been working on a painting of, uh, that, that depicts George Washington's visit to Trenton, New Jersey, on his way to New York for the, his inauguration. And it's the women of Trent, Trenton. Uh, uh, presented him with flowers and all this stuff, and it's a beautiful painting, uh, really a mural that he was installing uh, on the the the, the ceiling uh, the, and 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 wall of a bank. He was up on a 30 foot scaffolding when he slipped and almost fell to his death. Um, that it was so freaked him out that 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 night he dreamed he dreamed of seeing George Washington uh, giving him a tour of the Battle of Brandywine, which was uh, right near where um, uh, Wyeth lived. And in his dream, he was up on a scaffolding uh, while Washington was on his white horse telling him about the battle that's happening around them. And he would then uh, paint uh, in, a, um, in a dream, I Dream of George Washington. <laughs> and it's a fantastic painting. Uh, it's almost an expressionist kind of thing. And it's since become my favorite N.C. Wyeth image. And, you know, it's just one of those things that happened on our, our own tour that intersected in, in almost magical ways with other people's interactions with Washington. Is that painting uh, at their gallery there in Brandywine? Uh, it, I think it is, but I've seen, I actually ran into it when we were working on this, uh, there was an N.C. Wyeth, uh, exhibit, uh, exhibit in, uh, the art gallery in Portland, Maine, and they had the painting. Um, so I saw it in Portland, Maine, uh, while I was working on this book, which was, you know, just another sort of fortuitous out of body experience. And it's, it's a wonderful painting. I don't know. I, I assume it will permanently be back at Brandywine. At the end of your book, you say Melissa still considers George Washington a mystery. Yeah. Do you? Uh, yes. I think, I, I think anyone who has spent a significant amount of time researching George Washington's life has to ultimately say uh, there are parts of this man that he purposely wanted to keep keep private. Uh, he and you know he instructed Martha to burn all their letters uh, uh, between each to each other, uh, and so we you know that and we know those letters there was vol- voluminous number of of letters. Uh, you know he was writing particularly during the revolution, writing to her all the time uh, during his tour. Martha stayed at the presidential residence throughout these tours, and he was writing to her all the time. Um, And so, you know, Washington's most inward thoughts are lost. And so I think there is a part of him uh, that, you know, will always be an enigma. Uh, and, And yet I have to say, after following him for a year and a half, uh, and experiencing him not just as a statesman or a general or a plantation owner, but as a traveler. Um, I began to have, uh, both Melissa and I had a, a sense of him more as a human being than you know we had ever before. But then ultimately, there is a part of him that he 
you know, that we will never know. And, you know, he gave this country so much. Uh, the revolution would not have been won without him. The presidency would not be uh, the office it is today without him. Uh, we would not be a union of states, I am convinced, without Washington as president. Um, and he gave this country so much. I think it's almost appropriate that, you know, he was able to keep his innermost thoughts to himself. You write about his farewell address <clears throat> some. Um, I read it after I uh, read your book, and I was intrigued that uh, he doesn't mention the the issue that is still very much in front of us today, slavery. And you talk about slavery in the book and people, all, you know, historians all the time. It seems to me in some ways let George Washington off the hook. They keep – saying it was his wife's fault or whatever, and he, really, you know, he freed them. But is is that really true? Right. Well, you know, I, I, you can't, and I, I determined, uh, even before we departed on this, not to let George Washington off the hook. And um, because you're right, yes, he freed his enslaved workers, but it happened at the very end of his life. Uh, you know, he, he didn't do it any earlier. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of complicating factors. It's a very complex legacy when it comes to Washington. But, you know, you can't give him an out-of-jail card uh, when it comes to slavery. Uh, and um, you're right, he, did not, he does not mention it in his farewell address. Washington's overall, his, his intense focus was on the Union. And, um, he, you know, he knew that if uh, the issue of slavery... Uh, was if he pushed that too hard early on, uh, he would alienate the southern states, and um, the, his dream of a strong union would inevitably fail. Uh, he made that judgment, and on the other hand, he also realized that for slavery to continue, uh, it would uh, it would all ultimately undermine the union. Uh, he was heard to say during his second term as president that if slavery should divide the country, he would go with the northern part, uh, which is a pretty extraordinary statement from someone who uh, was a Virginian. Uh, so, you know, Washington, it's really complex. Washington's focus was on the Union. He made that judgment call. Uh, he felt if he, he pushed the issue of slavery, there would not be a Union. And remember, it was the Union, uh, the preservation of the Union that led Abraham Lincoln, you know, 75 years later, uh, to to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. But you can't let him off the hook. He, you know, he he you got to give him credit for moving beyond uh, uh, the 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 unrepentant slaveholder he was before the Revolution. But ultimately, he was unable to completely free himself from the preconceptions he had grown up with. You say in the book you have a new hero. We talked a little bit about the district boundary stones earlier, and um, a guy named Banneker. We have a high school here named Banneker High mm -hmm. School. Uh, why is he a new hero of yours? Well, he, uh, he was a free African-American uh, from Maryland uh, who was one of the surveyors um, at the beginning of of the process of planting those survey stones uh, that mark the, the uh, boundaries of Washington, D.C. You know, he was uh, pretty much self-educated. Uh, he um, he, he uh, was a mathematical genius, published his own almanac, uh, report, reportedly uh, built his own clock out of entirely out of operating clock out of wood uh, and uh, you know would do the mathematical equations and, and observations associated with the survey that uh, began this country and while he was doing that summer while he was doing this he wrote none other than Thomas Jefferson a letter um, praising Jefferson for having written uh, the, the Declaration of Independence and its uh, statement that all people are created equal, but ca chastising him for being a slaveholder, asking him, you know, how could, could you write that statement and hold so many of my, of my people in bondage? And, uh, you know, it was a, a letter that was widely circulated that uh, Jefferson would respond to 
but uh, he was clearly not you know, put in a very difficult situation by it. But there is, you know, there is someone, uh, you know, actively surveying Washington, what will become Washington, D.C., an African-American who calls out uh, Thomas Jefferson. So, yes, he is my new hero. I'm looking at a list of all the books you've written, I think, um, <clears throat> trying to keep track of all them. I count 11 plus this new one. Am I right about that? Yes, I, I that's about right. I, I, I don't can't tell you the truth, the, the exact number either, but something like that, yes. On that list, which one has been the most successful? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, I guess, a tie between um, uh, In the Heart of the Sea and Mayflower. Uh, Mayflower actually sold more when it first came out, but uh, since In the Heart of the Sea was turned into a movie, that gave it a boost uh, you know, 13 years later, that that uh, probably uh, sold it. So I, I would say those those, in terms of just book number of books sold, uh, those two. Have you ever totaled the number of books you've sold altogether? Um, I, I've <laughs> sort of talked in loose terms uh, with uh, my agent once, and it's um, a, I don't know a couple million, something like that. Which one did you enjoy the most? Oh, I, I, I enjoy all of them. They're like my children. Um, I cannot, um, uh, you know, um, I, I, every, what I love about what I do is that each book is, I'm learning something new. Uh, I don't write these books because I'm an expert. I write these books because I, I haven't seen a book about a topic that I would like to read. I, and, and the learning process is what I, I so enjoy. And so each one is unique. Um, in the Heart of the Sea was kind of where it all began for me, and my kids were still, uh, you know, in, in school. And, and so, you know, that, that has sort of an, an emotional uh, resonance for me. But, you know, I have to say Travels with George, um, Driving the Country with Melissa and, and Dora, uh, I, it's, it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's one of the more challenging, uh, invigorating, and cathartic experiences I've ever had. And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, you know, I, I can't really honestly answer that question. In 2014, 2017, 2018, if I count right and tell me if my years are wrong, you wrote three books that revolved around the American Revolution, Bunker Hill, Valiant Ambition, and In the Hurricane's Eye. Do I have that right? Yes. If somebody took the time to read all three of those, they, they haven't read any of them, what basically what are you going to get? What what are you going to learn that you if you didn't ever uh, pay that close attention to the American Revolution would you get it all? Uh, you know I don't know if you'd get it all, but what what you'd get is um, you know I did not originally intend to write a trilogy about the Revolution. I, it began with Bunker Hill. I wanted to write a book about the city of Boston, uh, which was then uh, about the size of Nantucket, you know, an island off. You know, uh, uh, connected by a thin neck of land to Roxbury, I wanted to write about that island experiencing a revolution, uh, and um, and so that led me uh, to the the arrival of George Washington just a few weeks after the Battle of Bunker Hill, and that initiated my fascination with Washington, which I never saw coming. And so uh, I wanted to find out what happened to him next. How would I get into the, the, the middle years of the war? Well, I wanted to pair him up with Benedict Arnold, um, who had always been my mother's hero, <laughs> strange to say. And so, and that, uh, that was, uh, you know, so, and it focuses on those two figures as their lives go in very different directions during those middle years. And then there's the third book in which I really focus on the naval battle. Uh, the Battle of the Chesapeake that made the victory at Yorktown uh, possible. I, you know, I have I sort of began on a maritime theme, and that enabled me to end my engagement with the Revolution uh, with a, a little-known ba uh, naval battle in which no Americans really participated, that allowed us to w ultimately win our independence. And so, uh, you know, I think if you read those three, 
uh, George Washington is the figure that makes his way through them, but there's also Nathaniel Green, Horatio Gates. There's a, there's a really um, a whole cast of characters that, with the end of uh, the trilogy and in, in the Hurricane's Eye, the epilogue uh, is is a series of mini biographies of each character telling you what happened to them in the years after the revolution. And, and for me, that was a very uh, you know personally gratifying process in which I was sort of able to take the tangled uh, yarns <laughs> that had been going through this uh, tapestry, if you will, uh, and, and you know, figure out where they all led. Many years ago, we asked a young man to do a statue of Alexis de Tocqueville, and it was his first ever um, uh, statue that he did, uh, and uh, we used it in our series on Alexis de Tocqueville, so when I got to page 258, Yep, <laughs> and saw and saw Thomas Spratt and the Catawba leader King Hagler by Chaz Fagan. I I just had to bring this up and ask you about Chaz Fagan's statue. Uh, he says that he had never gotten into this business until we asked him to do Tocqueville. So uh, why did you put a picture of it in the book and write about Chaz Fagan? Yeah, well, Chaz Fagan, uh, you know, we we uh, we came across this statue in in Charlotte. And uh, we had just visited the Catawba Reservation, and, and uh, this statue depicts uh, one of the leaders of the Catawbas, and, and it's a great statue. And, uh, and actually, when I was at the Catawba Reservation, I said, what information do you have about Washington's visit? And they said, you should talk to Chaz Fagan, because he heavily researched that statue uh, when he was working on it. And, and work cooperatively um, with the tribe. And, and so uh, uh, I called Chaz up, and, and he told me the story of how you guys gave him his start. He's extraordinarily grateful. And, you know, and he is a sculptor, but he's also a historian. And, uh, uh, and he, he grew up uh, in the Pittsburgh area, and so we, we had that kind of as a bond. And he's just a wonderful guy. And, um, you know, and this is another... Uh, example of the kind of serendipity uh, involved in this this tour uh, of coming across this statue like this and then meeting uh, uh, you know learning uh, talking to uh, a sculptor who uh, had such an uh, personal and historical engagement with with Washington uh, uh, in making the statue. Before we close down, tell us about your uh, writing environment. Uh, what do you write with? What time of day do you write? Uh, where do you write? Yeah, well, I um, I treat it really as a job. I uh, uh, back when my wife was working uh, uh, every, you know, I had a full time job. I w- I work in my uh, basement office uh, of our house on Nantucket. It's a book lined uh, uh, study, uh, and I it's filled with the books I've I've acquired in to research what I'm working on. And uh, I try to be at my desk by nine o'clock, and I uh, work to a late lunch, uh, usually between twelve thirty and one o'clock, maybe a little later. Uh, get lunch downtown on uh, Nantucket. It's about a quarter mile walk at the pharmacy. Uh, then walk up my dog Dora, uh, and back at the uh, desk. Uh, you know, an hour, hour and a half later, uh, uh, work. Uh, till four or so and give Dora another walk, uh, return, and then work till um, uh, dinner time, uh, six or, or seven o'clock. And uh, that's, that's, you know, that's what I do. Uh, 75% of my time is research and, and uh, note-taking. I work on a computer uh, and uh, create uh, literally hundreds of pages of notes for each chapter that I then uh, Divide up, uh, break into sections. Uh, as I as I begin to write the chapter, I, I uh, uh, print the chapter, uh, print the what I, each day's work and scribble over it, and then um, and then uh, rewrite and ultimately read that chapter for a draft of that chapter to Melissa, who um, uh, usually while she's doing the dishes uh, and. Um, and uh, she then gives me her critique, which can be devastating, but it's also a great process by which to read 
um, what I'm writing. It, it's just a whole new way of looking at the material. And with her input, I, uh, I uh, rewrite it and uh, send it to my father, who's 92, and uh, on the Cape, a uh, retired English professor. He gives me my, his input, and once I've integrated that, it's on to the next chapter, and so it goes. Next book? I am headed to the gold rush. I've, uh, one of my favorite researching and writing experiences was The Last Stand about the Battle of Little Bighorn. And I really miss the West. And uh, this will uh, give me the chance to you know, head west. And it, you know, it happens by land and it happens by sea. Uh, you know, some of the, the, the 49ers came around the Horn or, or took a steamboat to the Isthmus. And so I'm really looking forward to it. Nathaniel Philbrick, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's, it's great to talk with you again, Brian. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.